And this is going to be on channel 99, right? I assume so. Is, uh, is Glenn joining us also? Yeah. Well, Doug, you look like you have a, a nice tan. <laughs> I, I got an overhead light here. I think that's good. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. I agree with John. It looks like a red light. Everybody, we got Evelyn? Oh, there's Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Okay, Hello, so Glenn. You little, I'm going to give a quick little update to everybody. Mark, our IT uh, consultant, is telling me because Microsoft is being so highly used at the moment, we can only do four at a time. But whoever speaks and becomes audible will fill in that spot. So we're all here, but we're only going to see four at a time versus up to 20, which it can do. But because it's being highly used right now, <coughs> They're limiting it to four right now while Microsoft works out their capacity issues. But we're all here. It's just when somebody talks, they'll pop up into the screen for your four. Okay, so we can get started. Uh, is Evelyn there? Can I have her talk to pop up? Maybe. Why doesn't somebody give her a call and just see where she is? Teresha says she's on the call. I just haven't seen her yet on it. Yeah, Here comes Teresha. Peggy, okay. Yes, hi guys. Glenn, myself. Like your background, Glenn. Thank you. You read all those books? Every one of them, cover to cover, backwards Good and man. forwards. And if you, you, you uh, believe that, I got a book in Brooklyn, I'll sell you. <laughs> why, don't, you why don't you take one off the bookshelf just so we know they're real and it's not just. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, look at this. It's a blue screen. <laughs> Down on Highland Beach. Look at that. Highland good. Beach right there. <laughs> really the Supreme Court on a blue screen. Very good. <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> Got to make sure they're real. All leather bound. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, not, none of them more recent than like 10 years ago because then it's all computers after that. Absolutely. We don't have a confirmation on Evelyn. Okay, no. There she is. The microphone should be on. The camera. I see you. What am I supposed to hit here? Oh, oh, there. Wait. She's coming okay, up. Here's Evelyn. I see well, the name. It takes a second. It takes about 10 okay. seconds. Okay. Huh? Hello? Okay, thank you. Wow. We're losing pictures based upon who talks. And then but it no, takes a bit for it to. Yeah, right now, John, you're the only person I can see now. Now, uh -huh. attorney. Linelda just turned her camera on. Okay, she's good. <clears throat> I hear Doug. As long as we can hear. Okay, can you hear me? I hear you. Boy, is this going to be fun. Oh, yes. I just had another meeting like this this morning, and that was loads of fun, too. Okay. Not switching so well. I see two pictures of John with two different names. I think when uh, somebody talks, then it takes a while to switch and then turn on the uh, video. Okay. As long as we can hear everybody, that's the key. It doesn't really matter if we can see. Boy, we're not making this easy on you, Doug, for your first meeting. You're going to have to figure this out. <laughs> Careful. No, no, no. Different channel. Just see if it's not the key. 
You keep switching whose picture is coming up. It's based upon who's talking. On my screen, I should see Evelyn right here, but I can't get her picture. I just see the initials. Yeah, me too. Yeah, you're <laughs> you were I don't know your... why. <laughs> it's uh, it's not coming up on the community channel. Well, this well, first hey, time I want... Mark, are we live yet, or we want to do a countdown? What are we doing? We're live. Yeah. Hey, Linalda, where are you at? I'm here. Listen, I just, I'm here. Why don't, why We're don't, actually don't, live, I believe. I don't right. know about China, Channel 99, but the recording is going. Okay. So we're good. Why We're don't we start the meeting because we can hear it. Okay. That, Mark will work okay. out the details as we go. Okay. That's the yeah, we're live on 99. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so are we good to go? I or think no? we go ahead and call it. We got the clerk here to keep the notes and keep it going. Mark's going to make sure 99 comes up. If it does or doesn't, he's working on that as we go. So if we get started, we should be, you know, we can do a roll call and get it going and see what happens. Okay. Call to order. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, get the cell phone silence. So, call to order. It is uh, 138147. Melba, would you do a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Shoemaker? Here. Commissioner David? Here. Commissioner Gossip Seidman? Here. Vice Mayor Bobby? Virtually present. Mayor Hillman? Present. Town Attorney Tercivia? I'm with Commissioner Bobby, virtually present. Town <laughs> Manager Labity. Present. Thank you. And let's uh, stand for a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence, please, for all of our first responders, all of our medical people that are putting their lives on the line every moment and uh, taking care of all the unfortunate ones that have come down with the virus, uh, with the virus if you will, please. I pledge of allegiance to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the republic for which, which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, indivisible and justice for all. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? No. Not us. Okay. Um, call for a motion to accept the agenda. All in favor? Say aye. 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 <clears throat> Need a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. Seconded. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So passed. Town Clerk, would you uh, go through the civility pledge, please? We will be respectful of one another even when we disagree. We will direct all comments to the issue. We will avoid personal attacks. Politeness costs so little by Abraham Lincoln. Thank you. Um, one comment on the Civility Pledge. For the year and a half I've been coming to these meetings, we've always read that. Um, do we think we need to continue with the Civility Pledge in the future? Okay. Anybody think we need to continue with it? I, for one, uh, this is John Schumacher. I feel that this civility pledge was put in place given the acrimony conflict over the past year or more. I think a lot of that is over and that we don't really need it now, but we could invoke it at some future date if we end up having a problem. I think right now we have to assume that uh, given everything that's going on, people will come 
and be civil. That's my view. I agree with John. It seems to me if you recite a civility pledge, it sounds like you are not civil. Greg, what are your thoughts? In agreement. Peggy? Agreed, and if we bring it back, maybe we can mix it up with a new a new statement by another author that's got a similar message, just to change it up. Okay, uh, seems like we all agree, so why don't we hold it off the agenda in the future, and hopefully we won't need it down the road. Thank you all. Thank you. Can um, I get a motion on that one? Yes, you may. Somebody want, John, you started first. You want to make the motion? I give a motion to uh, withdraw the civil pledge until we uh, replace it with something uh, in the future. Need a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next on the agenda is uh, presentations and proclamations. I don't think there are any, so let's move on. Public comments. Okay, public comments. We received two public comments, and I'll read them into the record. The first one was received by Virginia Bradford, and her comment is as follows. I go walking on our A1A walkway most mornings and some afternoons, and lately I am observing a dis distressing trend. The vast majority of the walkers, bike riders, skateboarders, and runners that I see aren't practicing social distancing at all. Yesterday morning, I walked for 45 minutes and passed numerous people, only three of whom were making an effort to stay the CDC recommended six feet away from the others. Several people stopped and chatted with others they met along their route with no distancing effort at all. Later in the day, I noticed that a few walkers had taken a walking in the bike lanes or out in the street trying to keep their distance. A solution to the problem, but not necessarily a safe one. When people pass each other, on the walkway, they are often only a foot or two apart. Fresh air isn't a disinfectant nor is exercise. And so I've decided to write to you and hopefully this will reach the mayor and commissioners. We need signatures, excuse me, we need signage and reminders about social distancing to keep our people safe. I don't want to see Highland Beach become a mini epic center in the pandemic. Thank you. That's Virginia Bradford. That was included in your agenda packet. The next public comment is from Kiri Borg, which was received today. She writes, um, we live on, we live Ocean facing at 3115 South Ocean Boulevard, AKA o Ocean Terrace North. There is a state law from 2018 in parentheses, House Bill 631, that is still on the books that states the beach sand from the ocean, mean high water line west is our private property. We all love our local police and appreciate them so much. However, our local police have no legal right to kick us off our own private pro beach property. This is not per the law and is unnecessary harassment. And in fact, it is safer for us to be exercising on our own private beach property using common sense social distancing than to further squeeze the si sidewalk of A1A where social distancing is challenging. So I would like to request that our wonderful police be directed by the chief and or the mayor, commissioners, town manager to at once stop forcing us to vacate our own private property, which per Florida statute 631 of 2018 includes our beach property stand up to the mean high water line. Best, Carrie Borg. That concludes the public comments. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, next are announcements. There are a few board vacancies. Okay. On the board vacancies, we have Board of Adjustment and Appeals Board. There's three vacancies for a three year term. We actually have one um, pending future interview slash appointment. On our financial advisory board, we have one vacancy for an unexpired term ending April 30th, 2022, which we also have one pending future interview slash appointment for that. Uh, meetings and events. We have a town commission meeting um, April 21st, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. That's tentative. And we have no board action report. Okay, on to the meat of the meeting, uh, ordinances and resolutions. Town okay. clerk, you want to take us through the ordinance number 20-003? Yes, we have an ordinance of the town commission of the town of Highland Beach, Florida, amending the code of ordinances chapter 30, <clears throat> zoning code section 30-68, supplemental district regulations to allow accessory marine structures to remain on property after a principal structure has been demolished, demoed, or removed, providing for conditions, providing for the repeal of all ordinances in conflict, providing for severability and conflict codification, and providing an effective date. I'm going to refer this to Marshall, our town manager, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as you see in your packet, uh, back in July of 19, the commission discussed um, making some ordinance modification to allow an accessory structure that would be like a boat lift, a, a dock, to remain when a principal structure is demolished. Uh, the issue we had is uh, the way the, the code is currently written, if you remove the principal use from structure, the accessory structure and use can't be maintained and has to be removed with demolition. As we know, the cost of putting in some of these boat lifts and or docks and the like can be quite expensive and sometimes they're in great condition. Uh, why would we want to go ahead and have those removed? So uh, the commission moved this to the planning board. The planning board met twice. Uh, they looked at surrounding communities best practices and what they were doing uh, and then the planning commission went through their exercise as reflected in the minutes of discussing this at great length and made a series of recommendation um, that are incorporated here for a first read um, whereby these structures uh, can be kept one they have to make application for a building permit within the uh, time period uh, so they have about uh, a year it looks like i can by these uh, uh, change provisions i can extend that up to 180 days so you get a year and a half by which the person after demolition has to apply for a building permit at which point in time once they make that application they have four years to get a certificate of occupancy during that period of time if the building official reviews the accessory structures and deems it safe and structurally sound uh, that can be maintained and it does not need to be removed. Uh, one of the caveats in that is, is we want to make sure the property remains safe, uh, remove any potential for attractive nuisances. Uh, so within 60 days, the petitioner would have to uh, develop a quick site plan that would show how they're going to protect the property from um, uh, other people using it or uh, people sneaking <coughs> into the property. So uh, they would have 60 days. Uh, the reason for this is instead of just saying a fence needs to be permitted, it allows it to be more aesthetic in nature and more in tune with the neighborhood in which uh, that, that vacant property and that accessory structure exists. So it kind of feels uh, uh, in concert or feels in continuity with uh, the surrounding environment. Uh, I will require, looks like two uh, posted no trespassing signs would have to be on uh, the property. Um, and the uh, one that might be of issue to discuss is if uh, currently the planning board has said the accessory structure cannot be used during this period. It can be maintained and they can keep it, but during all of this uh, waiting to apply for a building permit and during construction, they cannot use that accessory structures. So uh, that's the ordinance that's before you on this first read and I can answer uh, any questions you might have. Also to let you know, uh, while we couldn't uh, 
get Ingrid in on the call. She's circling. So if you have a specific question to uh, the actions of the planning board, we can track her down here to, to answer any questions. But um, her memo that you have before you in the record that she supplied is quite extensive. Uh, it kind of gives you the background on how the planning board uh, came to constructing their decision. Thank you. Um, well, why don't we just run through it? You want to start us off, John, with your thoughts? Uh, yes, this is uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I've read through this, uh, uh, spoken to our town manager, um, and I see no issues here. I, I almost think it's common sense. Uh, I'm not sure I know why this, this seems to have taken so much time, but uh, the only issue for me really was as long as it's uh, safe and not dangerous to others on the property as well as to other boaters. And I really don't have a problem with the owner being able to dock his boat there while the construction is going on. I don't see any reason not to allow that. So I think this is good. Uh, I, I would support it. Well, you're, if you support it, the owner cannot use the dock. I, I think that was uh, an issue of uh, that Marshall mentioned as an open issue. But if is it not reasonable to add that to three or four words to okay. it? If, that that would be a change. Yeah. If, okay. If, if if I may procedurally, you can make these changes between the first read and the second read. So if there was, um, I guess this uh, for for our newer uh, commissioner mayor. Uh, between first read and second read, you can tweak it. Uh, again, the planning board made their recommendations. So if you're compelled to make these changes, what we would do is, is you would approve the first reading conditioned on some change, and then Ingrid would modify it, bring you back um, that version that you guys want or those final little tweaks on it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on then. So that would be a recommendation that you would have to make an adjustment to. Yes. Got it. Okay, let's uh, move forward. Um, Evelyn, are you with us okay. still? Okay, I oh, disagree with John. I think not only shouldn't they be allowed to use it, I think we should not allow any electricity or sewer hookups to be utilized. And I don't understand why they would then have, after they get a building permit, why would we allow them four years to finish building that sounds like an awfully long time to me i mean if you add it all together it could be five and a half years before they get a co on that bit property well it's a long time what's the rush why are we rushing them to do this because we're allowing them to leave it on the basis that they're going to rebuild something I want to know they're going to rebuild something. Okay. Anything else? No other. Uh, so I agree with doing it. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit long in this, but I thought long and hard about it, and I talked to a lot of people. Uh, so. Please bear with me and I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Um, I'm coming at it as a, at a more unique perspective. Uh, I have a waterfront lot and I spoke to a lot of the waterfront lot owners and I broke this up in a few different topics. So the first topic is allowing accessory structures to remain and be maintained. So allowing the dock or allowing the boat lift. Um, I think it's a great idea to allow them. Let's step back and think about these for a second. Uh, a dock useful life is about 20 years if it's wood or it's composite. It's about 40 years if it's a concrete dock. Kind of silly to force someone to pull something out for any amount of time, uh, particularly when it has a lot of a useful life left. Uh, a boat lift has about 15 years useful life, but probably longer. I mean, I recently did a repair of a boat lift that was almost 20 years old and it works great. So uh, in terms of allowing the structures to remain, and be maintained. I don't think there should be a, a time horizon and a reason to destroy something that has a fair amount of useful life. Uh, in terms of, and that's whether it's a vacant lot 
a lot with a house, uh, a, a lot that's been wrecked. It seems seem totally to wreck something that was so expensive and has a long useful life. In terms of fencing, the second topic, I like the idea how they had the submitting a plan for fencing and landscaping, get rid of the chain link fence, do a decorative fence, do the sod. Um, there's a perfect example of this. It was 4205 Intercoastal Drive in Belito. It was sodded and had a nice decorative fence for almost three years, and the neighbors loved it. They liked it as green space. Looked a lot better than a chain link fence. <clears throat> So that brings me to the most interesting topic, the topic three, the ability to use the accessory structures. So this is pretty neat. Um, I'm gonna come at it for a few different angles of attack. If you have a lot and you wrecked the house and you wanna use the dock or uh, park a boat there, well, if you're a lot owner who owns another lot within a thousand feet, you can unify the title. And you can do that. So we've already solved part of that solution with what we did previously. So that one's easy peasy. Um, what if you don't own another lot? You only purchased this one lot, let's just say it's in Belito, and you want to possibly utilize it. Um, I actually am a big proponent of what the town of North Palm Beach regulation state and it's actually really elegant how they did it if you really dive into it they said um the use is limited to one vessel per for personal enjoyment of the lot owner and they don't have the ability to rent out the dock space well we don't let them rent out the dock space anyway in our town but if you think about it and you really read between the lines it's part how they did it no sewer or no electrical services permitted, and no live aboard vessels. Well, FPL will not give you electric on an empty property anyway. Michael Rothberg taught us all that and why he was going through his unity of title. So the translation is, if you buy a piece of property and you wreck the house and it has a boat lift on it, you have no ability to use the boat lift because you have no power. Okay, so that's great. Leave the boat lift, you can't use it. That works out well. Now, if you have a decent sized boat, let's talk like a 30 foot or larger boat, they all have plugins to keep the batteries charged, keep the village pumps going, and ideally if it's a big enough boat to run the air conditioner to keep mold out of there. Well, if you don't have power, you can't plug into the power pedestal, you can't actually keep your batteries charged and keep the air conditioning running. So the way North of Palm Beach wrote this, you can't buy a lot and park a really large boat there because it's a little board vessel. Sorry, not allowed. And even for like a 30 or 40 foot boat, you're not gonna be able to do it because you have no power to keep your batteries charged, keep your village pumps running and run the air conditioning. So what is, what is North Palm Beach really saying? Hey, you can buy your property, but if you wanna use it, you're either putting a small little boat there, like a little 20 foot boat that doesn't have power to be plugged in, or you're going to use it to launch kayaks and uh, paddle boards and stuff like that. And that's really your only use. I think that's actually pretty elegant. If someone buys a property and maybe they're going to eventually build a house and they want to launch their kayaks there on a Saturday or Sunday, I don't really think that's that big of a deal. If you want to have a really tiny boat there, I don't think that's that big of a deal either. The big complaints I heard from residents we're more around the lines of, well, I don't want someone to buy a lot and then put a 100-foot boat there, and then they just leave it. Great. They can't. It's a liveaboard boat, and it has no power. They don't have the ability to do that anyway. So really, the way North Palm Beach did it, I think, is actually very elegant, and it's probably the right way to do it. So now let's talk a little bit about um, some resident feedback that I got. Um, the way we have the ordinance written, you're basically telling residents, hey, if you buy a lot and you want to be able to use the dock, keep the old dilapidated house in place. Yeah, make it just good enough so you're not going to get any code violations, but leave it there. Don't tear it down. That way, no timeline starts. Well, residents, a few residents had some good thoughts on this. They said, well, if we know it's a one-story old 1960s house, and it might even look okay, but everyone knows it's empty, you're now inviting break-ins for it. There's never a car there. There's never lights on. It's always empty. Now, and we actually had one of those in Bell Lido a while ago. Uh, so you're inviting break-ins. Secondly, 
you're also encouraging short-term rental. I have a, I buy this piece of property. I want it for my boat. I put it there. I'm leaving a small house there. Well, now I got to pay the taxes on the house. I got to pay the electric. I got to pay water. Hey, I might as well rent it out. Sure, short-term rentals. Why not? I'm being forced to keep the house anyway. So now all we're doing, by the way, the current law is written, is we're saying either rent it out short-term or invite break-ins. So a lot of residents said to me, not a lot, but a few, four residents said to me, I'd much prefer a grassy lot and let them use it for basic stuff than a house that's left empty all the time or a house that becomes a short-term rental. So important things. I didn't think about any of that. Um, I agree. You want to discourage empty lots from becoming parking lots. So you should have a fence. That makes sense. I understand why the um, the planning board was on page with that. I agree the building inspector should certify the soundness. That obviously makes sense. Uh, I like the idea of 60 days. If you if you level the house, uh, you got to till it and put it in one side. But my recommendation is actually to circulate the North Palm Beach ordinance for everyone to review and see if there's other some other good nuggets in there. And the last thing I'll state is I think what we put together, and I got this from a fair amount of residents, what we have in front of us now as a first reading is being viewed as overly restrictive and unnecessarily so. And that's all I have to say. Well, you did a good piece of research there, didn't you? It came to me. I get 0.0, .0 credit. When this came out in the agenda, the phone started ringing off the hook. Well, I read it over carefully, and I went to a couple of their meetings. <clears throat> I think it's overly restrictive as well. I see no reason why the dock can't be used. Uh, I am also opposed to tearing down a good dock. Um, I had mentioned at their one of their meetings, or it might have been at one of the board meetings, uh, commission meetings, I'm not sure. But the investment in a piece of real estate like this is quite substantial. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm sure it's north of a million dollars. Might be a million and a half or two. Two to three. Pardon me? Two to three. Two to three, thank you. Correct, correct, Greg. I would think that somebody investing that kind of money that is not ready to put in a large house right away would certainly consider doing some lovely landscaping on that lot, not just some. And if lovely landscaping for a lot like that is seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars, that's not a large investment if it's going to last eight, ten years. That's ten thousand dollars a year. That would be a nice enhancement for the neighborhood. Green space. I would think the neighbors would much prefer that than going through two to three years of major construction because any house that goes on a two to three million dollar lot is going to be a very substantial home. So I'm sure the neighbors would love it. I think um, it would be beneficial to everybody. And I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to see that as opposed to just some even decorative fencing with just some sod and preserve the dock and allow usage all this time. Seems to me to be a much better solution than forcing somebody to tear down a perfectly good dock. Um, I do think what you found when you went through what was done north of us makes a whole lot of sense. If I was this homeowner, I'd put in a very inexpensive house so I could get my electric and I would put my large boat out there. And then I would rent the house or keep what I was going to tear down and do just what you were describing. So I think we need to get a little bit creative here, send it back with some creative ideas for them to look at. Um, I don't know why we're trying to push somebody into building faster than they might want to build. So I think it needs some more work. Excuse Mary, you make a good point because one of the residents came to me, not on this ordinance, but on a, an actual situation this week because uh, he's going to be building a property in Belito and his timeline is going to have to slow when he starts and when he finishes because he happens to own a very large company and he now is paying everyone employees for to sit at home. So he's got zero revenues and hundreds of um, salaries to pay a month. So he's going to just have to push everything back. He might have to push it back six months. He might have to push it back a year. He's still going to build it. Well, but, it's a hardship exclusion that you know one would have to consider. But also, I mean, Peggy has lived, what, 25 years there, Peg? 
in Highland Beach with the dock yeah. 30 years this month. 30 years. Well, supposing Peggy and her family decided they were going to tear their house down and build a new house. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but, but would I that be pretend. in the interim? You have to move your boat? You have to. Right. I mean, so that doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Either. If I could weigh in a little bit, Mayor. Absolutely. Please do. Thank you, sir. Um, first of all, I have not spoken to uh, Greg, the vice mayor, but we must have talked to some similar people on uh, the neighborhood. But I agree with about 90 percent of what the vice mayor said. Um, the, the ordinance should be all about keeping an owner, you know, solid and honest to the intent of the lot. We, we do not want to encourage short term rentals. I do know of a short term rental in town who ties up three boats to a short term rental property. It's sure. a little it's overkill. And um, I do think the intent is that we have wonderful citizens, residents moving in and bringing their boat or boats, kayak in a boat, and uh, using their properties in the interim. I do think this is a bit restrictive. So I, I did not look at North Palm Beach, but I think this is a good chance to do so. And lastly, something that I really think is left out of this ordinance is where is the approval of the seawall? I have seen docks put in with a seawall that isn't perhaps updated or sound. And you cannot have a dock and a lift without the seawall being completely thoroughly built. I have seen this on spec homes and other homes, not only in this community, but Delray Beach. And I think that has to be considered that that seawall needs to be completely true and before a lift and a dock can be kept. Um, one little piece of history is this came up about a year and a half ago because uh, in one community, there was one dock that was falling in. If you stepped on it, your foot would go through. You'd end up in the water. And that should have come out. And there was another dock on a sale of a property, which was very in very excellent working order, along with the seawall, and should never have been tagged to be removed. And this is when we took this on ourselves. So they're both scenarios. And I, I look forward to perhaps bringing this back with some tweaks to it. And in North Palm Beach, uh, I'd like to run that North Palm Beach ordinance and look at it. Yep. You know, Mayor, I might add yeah. something? Thank you. Uh, please, yes. please do. Uh, I, I completely agree with Peggy on this. Um, and I was totally remiss in that. You're exactly right. Uh, a seawall repair is actually very inexpensive. A seawall replacement is actually very expensive. Um, and that should be part of the safety inspection. It should be the dock, it should be the lift, and it should be the seawall. Yes, without a doubt. Uh, seawalls were designed the last 60 years. They're actually lasting a fair amount longer if you maintain them, like 80 years plus. So, yeah, it's got to be, that's, that's your skeleton of your property. You know, just a quick side note on seawalls. The easiest and most inexpensive thing to maintain are the weep holes. If people just stay on top of their weep holes, they're going to get an immeasurable length of time more on their seawalls. And that uh, is something that's always overlooked. But there's a lesson to be learned here that just came out with just the two of you. And that is, we have to talk to residents that are most affected. And clearly, the residents were overlooked on that. And uh, I, I just think before we start putting pen to paper, we've got to talk to the, the residents that are most affected on these things. And Let's just learn a lesson by that. And we've got to make sure that our boards understand that when they start looking into these kind of things. Yes, Mayor. So Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> I could just add that um, a great portion of our town, all of our intercoastal properties are on a, a completely 35 mile an hour speed limit for boats that is not followed by a number of boats. And therefore their seawalls take a lot of battering. They have to be inspected yearly. And those on the lakes and the canals have a lesser impact from the wave action to their seawalls. But we really have to be strong and keep the seawall, boat dock, and lift all together as sort of looking at it as a, as a full unit when we discuss these things, in my opinion. Total agreement. Mayor, this is John, if I could. <clears throat> I uh, also spoke to some boat owners, uh, happened to be down in Miami, about this whole kind of problem. And the thing that uh, was impressive to me is that there was a, a lot that was scraped. Uh, and because the owner bought the lot and he had a very large yard, uh, well, 80 feet, he did park it there to store it. 
while the house was being built. Now, I think the point about five years, now this was a $25 million home, very unique in its design. As, as he described it to me, by the time you finish the architectural plans, get the permits, uh, you test the property itself, perking it and whatnot, uh, getting the funding when that's needed because it's not always just cash. Uh, it then takes after two or three years to build uh, a, one of these fancy homes. I know five years sounds unreasonable, but if at any point you have delays because of hurricanes, because of problems with the property or with the builder, I mean, it could easily go four or five years for a 25 or million dollar or greater home. Um, so when I read through this, I really felt I was good with it, except, you know, that they should be able to store their boat or even use a small boat. I think that uh, uh, the vice mayor's comments about power and all of the things that's needed uh, to operate from a lift off a property. Well, that's for continuous operation. I think the issue comes down to more of people who want to keep their boat there, store it while the house is being built. And I think it's an excellent point about the seawall. I frankly did not think of that. So that's my comment. Um, Marshall? Yes, sir. How, uh, how do we capsulize all this and send it back with appropriate instructions? So um, based on that statement is one of your options. Are you interested in sending it back to the planning board for further review with the directions that you're looking for the ability for a vessel to be capped, no power, no electric or sewer hookups, uh, a longer term uh, potential requirement or no requirement for certificate of occupancy, um, and then including some element of a seawall review during the structural inspection. So well, we can I, send it back with those notes to the planning board. We can, I don't know that we're suggesting no power, are we? I heard that in there. John, um, John didn't suggest no power. John I, I, said that they I, have the ability to either store it the, and use it. I'm not sure. North John Palm said. Beach said no power in theirs. But what Greg said is if there's no house, FPL will not hook up power to the dock. Correct. Right. Well, and, and let me let me clarify part of that because there's a, there's a few different components here. If you have an empty lot, and you do not have a building permit, you can't get temporary power. So if you're just leaving the lot vacant with nothing to do with it, LPL is not going to give you power. If, what about a generator? Um, I th it's a good question. I didn't think about it. It's that. another accessory. A, a mobile generator. Oops, I'm sorry, Mark. No, I'm no, saying it, if But if you are actually building a property, if you're building a house, one of the first things FPL does is put in temporary power. So if you have a building permit and you're putting a house together, you even if it takes five years, you've got temporary power. So you've got exactly. power to the dock and you've got power for lifts. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're not building, you can use your generators, but you've got to do that rather frequently or your batteries are going to go dry. Right. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Yes. Another uh, point to consider. I was trying to pull up the code, but we do have a timeline restriction on building permits. And I don't believe that one can go four or five and a half years with regard to a building permit, but there are restrictions. I know one home went two and three quarters years being built. And um, so I'd like to, to refer to our codes to check on that as for the uh, four year time limit here. Oh, good point. Because we, you can't build a house for four years. No, I think. I think and building permits expire. Yeah, I believe the way this is written is they have four years, right. but, it doesn't, but it refers back to whatever our code is based on when they get their permit. Right. I understand but that needs to be looked at because in the past, homes went years and years being built, and that isn't conducive to a... No, that's not acceptable. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Mayor, can we make a motion or can I, will you accept the motion where uh, we have the North Palm Beach ordinance circulated so we can all look at it because all we've seen is a summary of it and it might help us if we actually look at that full documentation before we send it to back to the planning board great idea all right i make a motion to circulate the north palm beach ordinance for accessory marine structures 
Second. Motion. And I would like to add, if we could keep the um, the referral to the board in a short timeline so we can get this handled and get it back to us as quickly as possible so we don't belabor it for months. Um, Marshall, can you add to that, please? Uh, yeah, I have some questions. Uh, yeah, that's my hand up. I was like, wait, so I don't I'll talk at once, right? We're all excitable. Um, uh, so we're going to circulate this ordinance with the planning board and the commission, or just the commission? Commission. Because um, the commission. motion is not to return it yet to the planning board. Or are we saying we want to return the it? The motion was to circulate the North Palm Beach ordinance with the commission, so then we can discuss it and figure out exactly what we want to send to the planning right. board. I so see. we don't want to send them another nebulous right. piece right. to look at, and then it goes back and forth three times. So yes. let's, have, let's just walk through this. We have another commission meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, right? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Do ma we have to send it back to the planning board? The planning Possibly board not. is just giving us suggestions. We yeah. can take it further. We don't have to send it back for them to rubber stamp what we are talking about. You I might have gotten their sure. input. Absolutely. Now let's go forward. Yeah, Absolutely. Evelyn, you might... You might have it. You might have it in a nutshell right there. Let's yeah. see what this is, and we might be able to button it up at the next meeting. Perfect. I agree. Um, well, quick question, Mayor. I, I think yeah. Evelyn is the only one where her video is not showing. If, right. if uh, Marshall wants to know that, or the IT, just uh, everybody else. I think does uh, come on the screen when they start talking, except Evelyn. Yeah, I'm just getting a big ED in a circle. Right. Uh, right. Me too. <laughs> See, Did you uh, the camera button? Evelyn, you didn't have to get dressed for this. Yeah. Did it, what can I say? <laughs> Wasted time. Did you I hit the camera button, Evelyn? Um, yeah, did you press I don't want to touch anything because I'm liable to disconnect this. Uh, so at least just, I can talk. You might you might have just pressed audio and not video. Correct. It's like if you move your cursor. You'll see a, a camera icon, and That's if there's a line cursor. through it, you curse it to the computer. I, yeah, I'm on a cell phone. Oh, my goodness. There is no cursor. If you touch, I'm on a cell phone, too. If you touch your screen, you'll get a series of stuff in the bottom, and then push the camera button. Okay. Got it. Hey! Hey! hey. hey. <laughs> All right. Now you have to hold it steady, though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, we're all here. You may uh, want to pull it back a little bit. Just <laughs> there, there you go. My arms are not that long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we beat that up pretty well. Does anybody have any more comments before we move on? Yes, sir. Uh, we need a vote on the motion. Okay, we need a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Bobby? Yes. Commissioner Gossip Seidman? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Shoemaker? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner David? Yes. And Mayor Hillman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. I can find my place here. What do we got? Uh, I'm in. Further comments, participation, CLA. I think, are we down to consent agenda? And just, just for the record, we're almost there. Just for the record, we had no public comments on the ordinance. Correct. Okay. Yes. So our next one is consent agenda. And there are no items for consent agenda. Nope. We're on unfinished business. There's no unfinished business. Correct. We're on to new business. What do we have for new business? Okay. Counselor? We have approved the recommendation of the selection committee for RFP 20-001, Enterprise Resource Planning Software, and authorize town staff to begin contract negotiation with the recommended firm, BS and A software. Mr. Marshall, town manager, you're on. Uh, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> so basically, as, as we know, we've been talking about this at great lengths. We went through the RFP process 
to solicit uh, interested parties to submit their proposal for an integrated uh, system, IT system that handles all municipal functions. So when we drafted our RFP, the draft of the RFP focused on one, it's a municipal software system. The other one is, is that all uh, modules, if you will, finance, um, HR, utility billing, community development, all integrate into each other. All financial transactions tie back to our general ledger, ledger and immediate action. So we went out, we solicited an RFP. We got two interested parties, two parties that do a lot of communities. Uh, one company uh, that we're recommending uh, a little bit more in the uh, upper Midwest. Uh, the other one is Tyler Tech, which is out of Texas, uh, a much bigger firm and has a, a lot of clients as well. Um, once we received those proposals, we went into a cone of silence. So the three people, I'm glad we're finally at this point so we can get out of this cone of silence and start talking about it. But um, we had a selection committee. We had a selection committee meeting and we went in in great details and scored each of the proposals based on the criteria that were established and set in the RFP. We went through, scored and ranked those. Uh, we asked supplemental uh, questions of both firms. They submitted those and those are part of the record. Um, we had our meeting, um, I believe that was on uh, March 4th to discuss um, in detail. Um, we went through the pros and cons of each um, and we went through our scores. And then based on that evaluation of which systems we had, um, the, the committee, um, all three committee members leaned towards the BSNA proposal. Um, it is below our um, budgeted amount that we put in there, um, anticipating that we would be spending these dollars. Um, if you look at it from the, the cost of uh, implementing those programs, they're about the same. Uh, the very initial upfront cost, um, slightly less for Tyler, but Tyler has an annual cost or maintenance cost um, that's double that of BSNA. And so basically Matt did a quick penciling of it went out five years and BSNA is cheaper significantly over the five year period. And then you could take a look at that longer uh, BSNA and their maintenance fee on a year to year basis has a cap. Tyler technology doesn't Tyler tech um, has some transactional fees. We really uncomfortable with um, we like BSNA's demonstration. Um, all three of us did. We scored that well. Um, the customer service record of BSNA is great. Um, they give 100% guarantee on their product for the first year, which is uh, no one else does that. So they give you all the money back. If it falls apart in implementation, you get all your money back and then you can move uh, towards Tyler Technology or another, another solution. So um, we went through that. I've also got circulating on this call because um, I know that there were questions in the community of uh, do you go to a cloud or versus um, on-site uh, solutions, BSNA is an on-site uh, server storage solution that we would operate. Um, the cost to do that is about $200 to get two terabytes and run the virtual machine here. Um, Mark um, Rutledge, our IT consultant with Node Zero is, I believe on here, I would like him to spend a couple of minutes going over those two platforms and the advantageous nature of BSNA or at least keeping it um, housed local. Um, so once he uh, gets queued up here, he will give a little background on that. It is, uh, uh, he spent a lot of time reviewing both of those platforms. Um, we are up to speed on all of our technology that's been upgraded over the last 18 months. Um, coincidentally, I've been here 18 months, so we've been doing a lot of IT investment and upgrade and bringing us into this modern time to to be able to handle a, a solution like this, an integrated solution. Um, again, uh, as Matt always jokes, uh, fun balance is going to college. That's how old it is. Um, and it's time for us to, to, to get caught up into uh, this century with technology and really get something that's real time connected, deployed throughout the organization. I know that there are other people who are saying licensing. Well, if you do uh, Tyler Tech, you have to buy more licenses and it adds up at 575 per license. BSNA doesn't. It's just you get to use all the modules, number of people in your organization, their price. It's unlimited number of users. And I believe I was uh, talking to Commissioner Shoemaker about this a little bit. Um, the, the idea is that the commission would also have access or read only access to this real time financial data, which will help you make your decisions 
uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as we move forward and govern that. And we can also uh, get some of that uh, basic access potentially if we want to the FAB to just take a look at it. But we'll be able to do reports in minutes versus weeks and months when we have to do uh, going back through the general ledger and doing re-enter things twice. Everything we do now is is old way of doing it without all the horsepower. So we're, we're, we're to the point I'm excited. We got the proposal in place. BSNA is good. Uh, the other thing that I will uh, say to it, and I did say in the selection committee, um, I've gone through a, a, a complete rollout with BSNA with my previous employer. Um, it was a successful rollout. Their customer service is good. Um, again, it is built to mirror best practices in municipal operations. I can't stress that enough that the way this firm has built it is when you go into the building software for building permits, it's designed by building officials. When you go into the finance, you have public finance professionals that have designed those modules. So it mirrors um, more of the public sector style approach in governance and, and operations. So that's in place. Again, with BSNA, I used it, went through the rollout. I'm a power user. There are some advantages to that here, uh, being a small organization to have at least somebody on board that knows how to use it. Um, with Tyler, we'd all be new. And again, I covered it uh, with the selection committee. Uh, um, and, and I know Matt says, either will work for us. Either option works. Either Tyler Tech or BSNA, they both work. It's just when we scored it and went through the process, the selection committee leaned towards BSNA as our solution. It's uh, more cost effective over the long term. There's no hidden fees or potential hidden fees or transactional fees, extra licenses. That stuff uh, doesn't exist with BSNA. Um, and they've had experience converting SmartGov. Tyler Technology doesn't convert SmartGov. Uh, we wanted to be able to capture all of our current building permit data. Um, if we do roll out, uh, fully implement the payroll system, they've implemented and rolled over Paylocity, who's our current vendor. Um, so they have the ability to, to do those things. Um, and the other thing that we avoided and the way we wrote the RFP is we didn't want to go to best and breed. We didn't want the best building permit software, the best HR, the best utility, the best, because they don't all communicate and talk. And then you have a whole bunch of problems of different systems that don't communicate. Our idea of being a small organization is one system, handles it all, all integrates back to the general ledger and finance system. Um, Mark, are you there to give a little background on the IT platform on the technology side? Yep, I'm uh, right here. So as far as the uh, server requirements, there was, a, uh, um, there was an email sent where some people had some concerns as far as the uh, turn up as far as on the uh, IT perspective, uh, hardware wise, there is almost no hardware requirements uh, for us um, other than buying in a couple of additional salt safe hard drives. Um, we are using barely even 1% of the server's capabilities right now. We are existing on the town side of the server. We have a uh, dual CPU uh, VM host, and uh, which is a virtual machine host. Um, it has 12 core processor, which is 24 logical cores, and we've got a total of 128 gigs of RAM and all solid state storage. So with that said, we could turn up any number of virtual machines, and that's specifically what BSNA is requiring. Uh, on their uh, original response to the RP, it said that their ideal configuration is a client-server environment, which is what we would set up. We would just turn on a virtual machine and then give access to the virtual machine to BSNA. They would install their software, and then it's as simple as installing the client-side software on each one of the workstations. Uh, why this benefits... Uh, the installation being installed locally benefits us more than a remote solution. You're being able to utilize the internal network speeds. Always your internal network speeds are going to far exceed any type of cloud-based access or remote access. And just remember, cloud is just somebody else's computer. It's just a fancy term for somebody else's computer. But that's contingent on the internet speed to which you're accessing, your internet speed as well as the internet speed on the opposing side. So... By using this local setup, um, it's going to meet and exceed all the expectations, and there's barely any turn up. I mean, a two terabyte solid state drive costs like two hundred thirty dollars, and that uh, just to for future provisioning, I recommend it's increasing the uh, server storage just to accommodate it if necessary. But right now, we don't necessarily even need that additional storage. Great. 
Okay, thank you. So that, that's, um, I can answer questions. Um, again, uh, we did not include uh, Tyler Technologies proposal. They had some proprietary uh, restrictions. So they said uh, we'd have to ask for certain permissions, but as we went through it and are leaning towards BSNA, it wasn't critical at this moment. Um, but we spent a lot of time on it. Um, we looked at it from every angle. We had our uh, official um, uh, selection committee meeting. Uh, we stayed in the cone of silence. And the reason why I reiterate these things is that the uh, inspector general does uh, review these. Um, we have followed our procurement uh, policies to the T. Uh, those that were interested had an opportunity to submit proposals for an integrated municipal IT solution. And we got uh, these two uh, options. We've gone through demonstrations, uh, day-long demonstrations with both firms, the selection committee, so we were able to see exactly what the, their, the robustness of each of their systems and how they operate. Um, anybody? Jump in. Marshall, um, what exactly would you be negotiating for? Um, well, basically, they said some, it, it's basically the price that's on the contract, but um, We'll take a look at sometimes um, under certain scenarios when you go into a contract because uh, under this scenario, it isn't a price only control. It's the price plus the proposal. So basically you go back to them and say, what's your, you know, I don't want to say final and best, but what are your final costs? Here's exactly what we want. And then they fine tune the price and we go into contract. So Glenn will put together a final contract. We'll kick it over to BSNA and move through that process and begin to negotiate. Uh, the only outstanding piece um, that we have and we haven't figured out is this Paylocity is relatively a good software and it's about 20 grand to roll out the payroll software that they have for both either firm. Um, we're working through once we get out of the cone of silence, Matt and I can talk a little bit more about it. But, you know, um, I would prefer that we implement the whole suite. Uh, he's a little bit reluctant on the Paylocity side. So. Uh, we'll go through that, negotiate it, uh, do our best to, I don't want to say squeeze them on price, but have them, you know, sharpen their pencils as we uh, move through our final uh, process, how long it would take to roll out. I think they're going to be wildly surprised with our platforms that we, that uh, Mark has been able to put in over the last 18 months. So I think we should be able to move along pretty quickly. What does quickly mean? What's your uh, six, estimate six. as to how long it would take to be up and running? That's a good question. Uh, they're saying three to six months. I, I'm probably going to lean towards the higher side of that, especially with our current situation that, you know, there's a lot of side by side uh, work. And right mm -hmm. now uh, with the, the crisis we're in or the public health emergency, uh, we're, we're going to be put behind the eight ball a little bit on, on doing some of that rollout. So I'm guessing from, you know, we'll probably have three three weeks of contract back and forth between Glenn and their firm because everybody's working remote might take a little bit of time and then uh, you know probably six months from the date of action is when I'm hoping uh, we can have it up and running or at least a fully model test that means or a, a, a version that can test fully and operate concurrently as we get through the closeout of our fiscal year and, 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 and shift it and get training and get practice uh, the good thing is, is we could do building ahead so we could do the community development piece first get them rolled off and take off and train and get them moving quickly and then bring in finance as we go so that option exists that certain modules can be put in place before others and kind of strategize that so six months i think it's going to be every bit of six months okay thank you mm -hmm. mr mayor go ahead yeah this is john shoemaker um First question I have is, is Channel 99 up and running, do you think, uh, Marshall? It's running. Yeah, it's running. Oh, okay, good. Um, so with ERP software, uh, I personally have been involved in several billion-dollar companies that went through an SAP implementation of an ERP system corporate-wide. I mean, in, in two cases, it broke the company for almost two years. It was just a devastating. So that's large scale ERP systems it's brutal now that was also a few years ago and it's gotten a little better but it's a tough uh, challenge in this case it seems like it's a, it's a uh, not nearly as complex 
but I would certainly estimate it's going to be closer to nine months, just from what I'm hearing from you, as I think a more realistic uh, implementation time frame. Um, I do think that the price is good. I do think that the uh, avoidance of online transaction fees is really important. Um, the fact that it's an integrated GL system, you know, smart gov, it's connectivity, it's uh, pulling all these apps together. Uh, that's a really good thing for the town. I'm sure it's going to mean a huge uh, improvement in efficiency, reporting, and our own decision making as we even spoke about, uh, Marshall. Uh, however, for the sake and the reason why I asked about TV, for the sake of viewers to this and for those in the town residents, uh, could you just review one more time in very simple terms uh, the main issue that has come up and that has been expressed to me is the issue between licensing this software and subscription um, and what the issues there are and, and your position on that. Uh, certainly. So with BSNA, you, with the implementation, you basically buy the software packages and both are both systems, both BSNA and Tyler Tech are what Tyler's conveniently called an evergreen. So as new stuff, new uh, improvements to the module, you get those as part of your annual maintenance fee. As they make those improvements, you get to roll that in. BSNA, it's, it's, a, it's a, once you buy the module, it's yours, and then you have your annual fee year to year. Uh, but there's no, I can have everybody using it. There's not additional licensure. With Tyler Technology, after 10, you're paying $575 per user. And then that also adds to their license fee, which on an annual or maintenance fee, if you will, on a year to year basis is twice of uh, BSNA. So uh, BSNA is a lower ownership cost. Uh, we can add a bunch of users, like everybody can use it. So um, it, it works out better that way. Uh, Mark, are you there? Do you have anything to add to the subscription versus licensing thing? Question? Um, I mean, it's it's really up to you guys how is, you, you, you want to, you know, schedule the, uh, the way that you pay for the software. I don't really have any uh, input on that, so. So, uh, BSNA is, it's, it's all one-time fee. You buy it, it's yours. And then you pay uh, under this current proposal, it's ninety three hundred dollars a year for all the, the whole platform. So if you for all modules, I'm sorry, I'm use their terminology for all modules, it's ninety three hundred dollars a year. Plus, there's a cap on that maintenance fee. It can't exceed the cost of an uh, uh, CIP. So it can't go any higher than basically the rate of inflation. Tyler Tech doesn't have uh, a cap and they have those transactional fees that are additional to it. And we didn't really care for that as well. Uh, Commissioner Shoemaker, we didn't like that scenario either, where every time a user comes on, we're going to pay. So, and we didn't want to pay for, we know we need about 20, we're going to have about 20 to 25 active users in the system. If not, if we do the timesheets and payroll, every employee has to use it. So, um, it's nice not that there is an additional cost for users, it's just so long as we have a workstation for them to work from, they get BSNA, and we can control the administrative rights to how they, how much level of access they have. Uh, with Tyler, you got to pay five seventy five per. So that would be like if every em uh, employee that's payrolled, you know, we would be buying an extra twenty licenses. It gets uh, uh, kind of steep for us. And like you said, uh, implementation. Uh, if Matt was to chime in, he would be shaking his head in full agreement that it's every bit of nine months. I like to stay aggressive on this and say six months because it's frustrating the system we currently have doesn't give me what I want when I want it so I can keep the commission and the residents and advisory boards happy. Um, but, you know, we can do it in phases too. We take care of building department, move it forward. And again, I think we're a little bit blessed that we're a smaller organization. Uh, I've, uh, the last organization I came from, we had 300 employees. Um, doing the rollout did have some complications on time because of the vast size of the organization here. Uh, we're smaller. Uh, our, our processes are so antiquated at times in the, based of course on the technology and finance that just we're going to move over to the established best practices of the software and we're good to go. We don't need to tweak a whole bunch of stuff to mirror our unique process. Our process is going to be driven by um, 
the software package. Okay. Peggy, anything to add? No, I, I feel that Marshall's uh, argument for the um, ESA is, uh, his arguments are very solid and uh, <coughs> sounds like it's more efficient and he's familiar with the organization. So I'm good with that. I read through and understood as much as I could without an engineering and administrative degree. Right. And I feel like it sounds like a good way to go. Okay, great. Greg? Thanks, or thanks, Mayor. Um, the only question I had, and I think Commissioner Shoemaker was trying to ask it, so I'll ask it a different way. Is there a way to pay for BSNA, since that's what um, Marshall is recommending? Is there a way to pay for that as a subscription service opposed to a larger upfront cost? And the only reason I ask is, we're now going into a little bit of precarious times again. What happens if a company disappears and you pop out $180,000 and then in two years, the company's gone. So your amortized cost is 90 grand a year, where if you were paying a subscription for that same service, I don't know, 15 grand a year or whatever, you'd only be out 30 grand. Is Do they have a way to purchase their software on a purely subscription price basis opposed to an upfront cost, or is that not available? That's not their business model, as we were uh, told when we met with the uh, the company representatives. That uh, I think it says it in their proposal in some sense. Tyler Technology offers something, something like that, uh, but it's not significant enough in savings because your year-to-year -year cost is so high that you know your annual maintenance fee then goes to like forty thousand dollars but you only have a seventy thousand upfront but then you're paying 40 per year to keep it going plus all the other fees that seemed a little bit too big um again that's why we asked a lot of questions on the, the performance of the company can it make it can it is it got legs to stay around um and it does, in my opinion. Again, we, uh, you can never forecast economic conditions, of course. But um, um, as part of our negotiation, we could ask and see if they want to stretch that initial payment out over a period of time. I could ask that as part of our contract negotiation. Maybe going back to uh, Commissioner David's statement, is there what are we negotiating? Maybe that's something uh, we can, or I will. It seems like we want to look at that. We could. See if instead of the 125, that's what the acquisition cost is, um, as it's proposed. Maybe a little bit less if we squeeze on certain things. So say that 125, and you break that over a period of time, maybe they would do something similar to that. Um, yeah, right. And that, and then and it's no negative comment on BSNA. It's just a comment on things change in the world pretty quickly. So if we can advertise a large upfront cost over time it kind of buys us an option on them staying in existence because the problem is if they go out of business, we're not getting anything back. And even if you put something in the contract, if they go out of business, we get something back, we're never really gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, you know, BSNA, if you look at their their track uh, record and their company performance, they're, they're growing quite quickly. Um, um, if you look at their uh, business components, so, uh, their revenues, they're a pretty substantial, uh, you know, company, and they're continuing to grow from year to year to year um, with a nearly 199% retention rate amongst all of their customers. Um, but I could ask that question if we want. I mean, if, you know, again, that's just not what their business model is. Uh, but yeah. again, if you went with Tyler Technology to get that subscription base, you're paying about 70 to 80 up front and then you're paying you know 30 to 40 per year so you're gonna within three to four years you're gonna double what you're paying to bsna on their model so i guess that would be if there is a risk on our end is that the company is going to fold within a year or two would be our risk and um, i don't get that uh, impression in any sense so uh, if i can jump in and just follow up on greg's thought here there unless their business is not exclusively, but primarily with municipalities, their current customer base is not in business now because all businesses are not operating. So their growth, if it's not municipalities, ain't happening. 
uh, I, would go, I would go a little bit further with that, that all of their customers are, they only do municipal. They don't do anybody else. So the municipalities would, in a sense, have to fold oh. failure of government because that's their customer base that pays them on a year-to-year -year basis. So ah, that great. would be, I mean, the risk is somewhat protected because, I mean, governments generally don't go out of, don't go bankrupt. I mean, I, you know. I mean, from the wow. Detroit area, I guess Detroit's gone bankrupt, but um, <laughs> you know, I guess I can't say never, but it's no. not as likely as if your customers are a small business clientele, things of that nature. Terrific. That's very reassuring. Glad Understood. you set me straight on that. I would just, uh, I'd follow Greg's lead on it. If it costs us a few more dollars to spread the payment a little bit, to get that 125 down to 75, 80, 90, and have to pay a little premium for it. I think it's worthwhile. Okay. Do you have anything else to add, Greg? No, I, 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 um, I echo exactly what you said. Might as well ask. Sure. Yeah. And I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. And if it costs us, you know, a few bucks for it, it's like buying some more insurance. Worthwhile. Yeah, buying an option. Okay. Otherwise, uh, seems very good to me. I was going to ask the same thing, you know, lease, what have you. You've answered all those questions. And uh, I think a big thing that uh, leans me towards BSA is you've had the experience with it. You know the software. It's going to make the learning curve a whole lot easier. Uh, and you've had the experience with the company, and you're obviously sold on them. So I think that's a huge benefit as well. Uh, I mean, the usability, I think, the bigger part rather than the company is – having used the module. So yeah, absolutely. So once the company trains and leaves <clears throat> to get new people, um, it's, it's nice to have somebody that's used it for some period of time to know how to get to certain pull what levers to pull, how to build a report, how these things tie together. Yeah. Yep. No, you're the go-to guy then. It's a big, big difference. Okay. Is, if there's no further discussion, um, no. I need a motion then to approve the recommendation and the selection from the selection committee to authorize the town staff to begin the contract negotiations with BSA for the software uh, for the enterprise resource planning for the ERP software from RFP number 20-001. Somebody want to? I move that. I second that that she moved. Uh, I need a roll call on this, please. We can do it all in favor. All in favor, then. Make it simple. Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, let us move on. Um, town clerk, did you read the title for item 12B under new business? Yes, that's approve the bid award and authorize the mayor to execute a contract for services with Henderlin Group Inc. for underground contractor services on an as needed basis. That is invitation to bid number 20 003. Marshall, you're on again. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this one's a little bit tricky. We had to send out a clarification for folks. It's a little bit different. Um, but again, this bid is not for a specific project. It's for potential projects that emerge with our utility systems, things that come up under emergency scenarios. Think water main breaks, sewer breaks, uh, issues with the lift station. Uh, if a lead collapses going to a home, we need a contractor at two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon to go fix these things because we don't have um, the resources or the equipment to do such. In order to do that, we need a whole bunch of potential work items, right? So you have a laundry list of uh, bid items that are work items, if you will. And in order to compare companies that are interested to bid, the engineer had to assign random bid quantities so we could calculate a number to, to get to to see who is the lowest price. So there isn't a million dollar project. Um, it's basically we put assignment, we signed random numbers. So the engineer from Baxter Woodman assigned random numbers to each work item or bid item, calculated that out. And then once you did all that math and penciled it through, now you see that Hinterland Group Incorporated is the lowest 
responsible bidder. So they bid on everything and they're the lowest price based on all of these work assignments or random work assignments that potentially get put in place and we would need to move forward. Now this is a little bit more, this is a little different from the previous one, which was a request for proposals and Linelda always kicks me under the table to make sure I clarify this was more of a invitation to bid, right? Linelda, smile. Yes, there's yes, this yes. smiling. So this yes. is an invitation to bid where basically price controls our decision. So long as the company has been in operation for a period of time, I believe it was five years, has lots of references, gives us their financials, they come recommended by certain references based on work, then we, we go the price and we issue it. So the, comp the background screen on the company is, are you legit? Can you function and are you well recommended? Yes, all these firms work. Now it's the price that controls our decision. Hinterland is the low responsible bidder. I can answer any questions. Anybody have any? Yes. Did you contact their references? Yes, the engineer did. The engineer contacted every all their references. As you notice that he even went through and repenciled some of the calculations that the contractors did in error. Uh, so Baxter Rubin did do a good job for us and did a very thorough investigation and review. Um, any again, similar to the last one, any four of these companies um, would do a great job. And um, oddly enough, a lot of them, I think all four of them, uh, their origins are in the Detroit area, oddly enough, by chance. So it's weird. I don't know how that happened. But they're well-established Florida companies. These companies have been down here for a long time. So this isn't okay. like they followed me down here. They've been down here for a long time. <laughs> Peggy? Uh, Peggy? No, nothing further at this time. I understand the, um, the point of the... Uh, I understand the point of the bids, and I just I don't understand, however, why there is a fairly large uh, disparity between hinterland and the the highest being Gianetti. How how Marshall? How do you figure there was such a disparity in the bids? So uh, the two middle are uh, similar. So basically, if you were to go to certain work items and find that one company would say bid sixty two dollars per linear foot, I'm just making this up. $62 a linear foot to replace 16 inch HDPE pipe. The other company bid $74 and we put a big quantity of 4,000 in there or 2,000. So right. basically their numbers on certain work items that we found would be more common. So as much as they're random numbers, we didn't go to like the most one off work item and say, we're gonna put all of our costs there. They looked at, okay, we have a 16 inch water, uh, uh, pressurized water system that's HDPE. Um, that's what we would spend most of our time fixing. Those bigger items, Calc runs the numbers up, and they just bid higher on it. I see. Okay, it was it's a lot of a lot of uh, detail here, but that is good synopsis. It is a big swing. I, yeah, it's it looks just, like Hinterland was a little bit hungrier for the work, which is right. Good. And then good the two us. middle ones, the two middle ones are very close. So that was just an interesting. Uh, you know, set of numbers that fell through there. So thank you. That's my major concern. Okay. Uh, Greg? Uh, one quick question, Marshall. Um, so for each of these companies, we went out and we had them bid on a variety of different projects. And they're projects we might do, correct? We basically took any all the possible work that we know might come up in an emergency or right. needed to make a repair. So are every they hard? type of work, and then the yep. engineer assigned bid quantities to it. Not for a specific project, but uh, like I was kind of telling with Peggy, we, we lean favoring more likely work, yeah. meaning we're most likely going to be fixing water main of a certain size versus a, a non-size. You know, I wouldn't right. put in you know, a 72 inch, you know, force main or a 72 inch gravity sewer. We don't have any of that. So we, we kind of pushed assigned numbers to things that we would do more often. And exactly. that's how we did it. So for the menu of projects we might need, are they held to the prices in the bid or can they completely rebid them again once we've hired one of them? Are no, they these are the prices. Anything? These are the negotiated right. prices. That's all I want to know. <laughs> Anything else? Good. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Mr. John? John? So, uh, 
and looking over the package, it's about a hundred pages, and all of this information that was developed. I mean, it's it's uh, quite comprehensive. Uh, I think Baxter Woodman did an outstanding job. Uh, and as I understood it, coming into this for the first time, um, these four organizations were giving given a list of those projects those requirements that we might need over a period of time and then use that basic list to craft an apples and apples comparison between the four organizations so that we could get not only their pricing but to make sure that they're all in in the same boat uh, so that there would be no discrepancies later on and that those prices are fixed uh, and that only if there was some additional thing separate from this, then that would be negotiated separately. That was, say, uh, a project comes up that's not even listed here, uh, but we then have some feel for the way they price and what their, uh, their cost would be, so that it's not like they could surprise us. Um, but I, I would say that the, the, this whole package really is substantial and, and covers everything from bonds. And uh, as I go down, there's a, there's a, I don't know if you can see it, but licenses, tax receipts, reference letters, uh, qualified vendor expertise. Uh, the, uh, it's amazing how much information is available yeah. for something that they're giving us a price. And in fact, if we never needed anything, we're good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I think it was well done. Yeah, very. Okay. Anybody have any more comments before we move forward on it? Once, twice, gone. Okay. Uh, with that said, is there a motion to approve the bid award and authorize the town manager and the town attorney to prepare the contract and appropriate documents to uh, move forward to authorize the mayor to execute the contract? for the ITV number 20-003. So moved. Need a second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Town Clerk, please read the title for item 12C under new business. Approve a bid award and authorized the mayor to execute a contract for services with National Water Main Cleaning Company for the state for the state road A1A gravity sanitary sewer closed circuit television inspection services. Invitation to bid number 20-005. Marshall, you got one more. All right, sir. Um, again, uh, talk about spread on prices. Um, you can see here we went from 92 to 271. Uh, so, you know, and I think 271 was the first one read, if I recall, when we had the bid opening and I fell out of my chair. Um, but again, we had uh, four bidders, uh, similar to the last one. Uh, they all have to be vetted. Uh, it goes based on price, so long as they qualify based on all their experiences, work references, tax receipts, the ability to do the work, um, and our low, uh, uh, low, Responsive bidder is the National Water Main Cleaning Company at $92,659.85. This project is for us to evaluate uh, the sanitary sewer system. And we've had some of this discussion at the commission level um, brought to us by, by Pat, who had indicated, you know, some of the laterals under A1A were, 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 were being found to be in really rough condition. Again, I think that the Rothberg project gave gave us some better looks into these when they televised it for us and one of them. And uh, based on the age of our infrastructure being 40 years old, our sewer system, it was time to let's take a look, see what we have, what needs to be fixed, because we don't want to be Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I don't want all this on the surface here. So um, we went and this company will go out. Um, again, what the engineer did first and foremost was took the as built of all of our existing uh, sanitary sewer collection system. Um, understanding that there's a lot of laterals and crossovers, we took a representative sample to be tested or videoed as part of this. So if we did 12, I think we were doing 12 crossovers along A1A, will give us a, a good idea of the condition of the other ones that are there. Um, and then televise the main uh, lateral collection system. So what we'll do is this company will go through, televise the entire system. 
Uh, they usually work from manhole to manhole so they can isolate, reduce flows, run the video through it. And then the engineer will take that data, create a report for us uh, by which a series of recommendations will be made as we need to, one, when we may need to make a repair, if at all. So we'll have a basic uh, a plan to work from after the video is completed and we can uh, move forward. So um, this one's a little bit more straightforward. It's, it is for a specific project. Um, it's within the budget. And again, we've had some of those conversations and uh, we have a low responsible bidder. Uh, Peggy, let's start with you. Sure. Um, first of all, I definitely don't want to be Fort Lauderdale in this sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I have uh, colleagues, I have friends who lived right near so where some of the breaks were, and they were, it was uh, misery, very miserable. Um, but I wonder what, does Pat have an idea, or do you, Marshall, what, what in advance of this work, what possible best case and worst case scenarios we would be. I'm guessing this best case would be no work. Yeah. Do we have any clue at this point, having looked at a few yep. situations? So again, don't hold me to these numbers, but I no. did ask um, the engineer with Baxter Woodman. I said, if we have to <laughs> reline the entire system, and the reason why I said lining is, is because in order to do a large civil project, we dig everything up and replace it. It's going to be extremely expensive, extremely disruptive. Uh, it'll be my last project in Highland Beach for these residents because they'll run me out of town. So, uh, right, right, right. So, the best, the greatest technology that are using is is to uh, to line the system to the greatest extent and do minimal civil projects to do things that couldn't be potentially lined. Jack and bore when you need to go across uh, A one A. And they said the project, something like that could be as much as, um, but that's for the doing all of it, bringing everything up, lining everything, replacing everything that's damaged. Um, but we're hoping that it's not. And uh, maybe, you know, some of the materials we have are in good shape. We do have some clay tile pipe. I, you know, uh, you know, that could be sub. that could be, let's take a look. I'm hoping, it, I'm hoping for the best, you know, the back end on this worst case scenario could be, you know, upwards of $5 million, but. Let's let us get in there, investigate here first, and get a report from the engineer to really know what we have to get our arms around before we have to begin to strategize asking residents for some some authorizations to do a larger project. Okay, understood. And I would add that uh, this needs to be done in advance of any Department of Transportation coming in for any work. That it would not make sense to pave before we fix the pipes. So we would be on a uh, pretty close uh, timeline here? I, I would agree wholeheartedly with you that um, at least do the main lining, like the lateral collection systems, we might be able to tie in the laterals with the FTOP project and just be a little bit ahead of them and tear out the road to do laterals. But we could okay. probably jack and bore them, not have to hit the surface. But I agree, we should be done before they come through. So it's- Because who knows with them, the dates and the timeline, and Things change quickly, so thank you for that. Those are my two major points. Okay. Thank you, Marshall. John, I'm going to slide over to you. Well, um, thank you, Mayor. I uh, again another incredible package. When I asked for paper, I certainly got it. It's over <laughs> 150 pages long. Um, but uh, if the town manager would also just confirm that our initial. Uh, only commitment is to the $92,700. And it is from that project that we uh, learn how, what the status is of the sewer system and what other projects would then have to flow from this. And those would be then uh, priced and bid separately, or would they be first uh, asked of this company to give us a price before, before we put it out to bid? No, so you're right. This is our only commitment to the National Water Main Cleaning Company is to televise it and give us all of that with a report as to what we see. They're basically going in and videoing everything, giving us a baseline data. Here's all the visuals. We turn that over to Baxter Woodman, who generates here's what you got, here's what you're looking at, and here's what you're going to need to do at some point in time and help us move through some type of capital strategy on how do we fix anything that needs to be fixed. Um, if it's not that bad, you, we could potentially, based on the size of the project, 
use the company we just approved to do some of that work. It just depends on what the scope and scale is found during the televising. If it's something significant, and I would probably even use our charter cap as kind of a, a baseline, if it's over that, you're, you should probably go out to bid. I would say usually around a couple hundred thousand or more, you start, it's a big enough project to bid independent rather than going to a, an on-call contractor to do. But if it's one-off laterals, your on-call contractor can do that, and it's it's quicker, it's easy, it's effect, cost-effective. As the project grows, you're going to be building a separate RFP or invitation to bid on a bigger project. Yeah, I, I was um, obviously interested in in uh, leveraging the experience and knowledge that this company gains. Um, the uh, National Water Main Cleaning Company is kind of a generic name, my goodness. Um, that everything that they learn in doing this $93,000 project to check it all out and then they'll understand what needs to be done and where that we could then contract them uh, directly without wasting more time to fix things that might be a problem without it going over the you know the cap before we have to go to a referendum or because uh, we have a much bigger problem on hand. I don't know <clears throat> if they have the ability to do the project. They have the ability to televise it, but I don't know if they're built to be a larger civil company that can do the lining. And I, I don't know. They didn't bid on the other stuff, so I, I don't know if National Water Main could handle a big because the lining is a unique process. Some companies just don't do it. If that's the strategy we go. If it's then it's civil, they might have a civil branch of this company, and they could potentially bid on the work. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Evelyn. Any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, a couple. When you're talking about lining, are you doing that with uh, my brain just shut down? Where they go through and they kind of put an epoxy in? Yep. And can you do that with clay pipes? I'm not 100% sure. It's a good question. We would have to, you may not be able to. And in that part, that's why I said some of the project might be line where you can, civil where the rest of it is. and reinstall I, I don't know it's a good question and is it possible if we have to reinstall that they can do it via boring as opposed to having to rip up the road they sure can yeah so yeah. that you know as, as much as we can avoid ripping up a1a it would be preferable For sure. i get that impression here avoid that <laughs> and how long would it take for us to get this video I'm sure we'll have something back within 60 days, have an idea what's going on. But again, it depends can, how quickly we can mobilize. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a good, we're coming into a good time as far as we're going to get into more of our low flow season uh, as far as as many users, basically right. snowbirds going home or going somewhere else to visit because this truly is their home. So, um, you know, while people go on vacation, we have lower flows and can can get a better better look at the system. Well, it's definitely better to be proactive than reactive. Oh, for sure. I agree. And, and we know that the pipes are old. We know that there are going to be problems. So I'm all in favor of doing this as soon as possible. Okay. Greg, anything to add? Nothing to add. All my questions are covered. Excellent. Uh, Marshall, when you and I were chatting about this, um, you elaborated a little bit on the traffic management and what was involved. You might sure. want to share that. Yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, with all of these bids, um, um, there's an MOT, uh, maintenance of traffic type plan that has to be put in together, put together. And then you'll see in this bid, it's a it's a sizable number. I mean, mm -hmm. and you may think, oh, it's potentially just for a flagman. No, it's more elaborate. It's all of the barricades. It's all of the signage. It's hiring the, the necessary equipment. It's getting plans to FDOT. It's getting FDOT approval. Um, so it's, it's, it gets elaborate. And when you think about three miles of traffic control, because the televising equipment isn't small, it's a big truck, a series of trucks that have to come in. And if they have to, part of the interesting part is, is they kind of remove blockages as part of this. So as they migrate through in video and there's a blockage they got to unblock it with pressure and backing and so there's some cleaning of the system that occurs while we're televising and 
Uh, there'll be times where we have to uh, probably block the lane for a portion of time while they're doing their work. And it's a pretty elaborate long-term uh, traffic maintenance plan that gets put together. So that's why it's a little bit more expensive than one might initially think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more comments before we move on? No. Okay, we need uh, a motion to approve uh, the bid award and for the town manager and town attorney to prepare the contract and for me to execute it. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Same. Aye. Okay, I think we are now on to town commission reports. Mayor, this is Linnell. The action. Yeah, what, what did I skip? Public comments. Um, there aren't any more. There comments. are none. Yes, just for the record, there are none. But oh, can we do commission reports now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. You want to kick it off? Any reports? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't really have anything specific to report on as a an assignment. Uh, however, I would. I want to make a few comments, uh, given this is my first time uh, in the session. Um, I, I do think from a, a personal standpoint, what will I think for me will be my practice is to really spend the time to be to learn uh, and to collect input from uh, the residents. And I think we've heard that today so far that and I appreciate your reinforcement of it, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that we take input from the residents and that we listen. And most important, honestly, is not to have any secrets and hidden agenda, which I think has in the past created uh, some of the <clears throat> skepticism and uh, concern about the integrity of, of the council and who's doing what and with what motive. So, being open up front and honest is a practice that I think is really important as we go forward for myself. That's where I am. Uh, I think from a uh, perspective as a commissioner trying to do his best here, my my interest is making sure that we have control over our tax uh, base, uh, ensuring the property values uh, in the town, ensuring the culture of Highland Beach as being a paradise that we want to retain without massive changes and massive projects that would create such turmoil as we have seen in the past. Uh, a couple more operational points that I'd make is uh, relative to some of the input on uh, the current crisis that we're going through. I have personally spent quite a bit of time going up and down uh, the walkway along A1A. And initially, I did see, as was given in the input in the very beginning uh, from a resident, that social distancing was not a common practice. However, I've seen in the last week a major change. And it is true now that you will see people, when they are uh, walking towards others, will actually move out of the sidewalk into the grass or even into the bike lane, uh, which you know, if this continues, could be a problem by itself because I know I was coming in one direction on my bike and both the sidewalk was full and the bike lane was full of people and there were even people in the middle on the grass. So uh, I actually had, I was doing circles and waiting for people to come by me so then I could continue on. So I think that is an issue for the town in terms of safety. Now, this kind of relates to beaches. Uh, I understand the governor's uh, order and the, the, the uh, town manager's reinforcement and Chief Hartman's reinforcement, which is, has been well-intentioned, really good, very positive, 
health, safety, and welfare, and all of that. However, at some point, and it may be coming sooner than we think, if after April 15th, and hopefully the top of the bell curve and the peak of this crisis, that may be in the third week of April, uh, maybe the fourth week, then we could relax the rule a bit uh, where we could allow couples or those to just walk on the beach, not cluster, not set up chairs, not use the beach for anything other than exercise, just to uh, you know, add an additional lane, so to speak, to the sidewalk, which is, I think, going to get worse as we go forward here. Maybe not as the season moves on, but a lot of people are stuck here in Highland Beach because they can't go back to the Northeast. New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, I know, in fact, we've had to extend some rentals here because of people who, who can't get back there or don't want to go back, right? Yeah. So uh, I think I'd be open to that. Uh, but again, I will support everything that the town manager has been doing in reinforcing the orders, the, uh, uh, the intention from the governor and the president of the United States. Um, so that in a nutshell wraps up, I think, just some general comments that I wanted to make. And I uh, really am uh, looking forward to working with everybody from residents to the council to deliver on the dream. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. We should probably not just call this commission report, reports slash comments. Thank you. <laughs> yes. um, Evelyn? Okay. Um, <clears throat> as far as John walking on the beach, as I understand it, when the governor or the county puts forth an executive order, we can make harsher orders, but we can't make more lenient orders. So we would have to hear from them that people could walk on the beach. And they did incorporate for both private beaches and public beaches. And I understand what you're saying, and I understand what that homeowner was saying. The problem that you run into is it's difficult to make exceptions to things because apartment buildings have beaches as well. So how do you say, okay, people from a single family home where it could be one or two or three people on a piece of beach and not tell the apartment owners, well, you have private beaches too, but you can't use them. Exactly right. That's so it, it's very problematic. If there was some way we could say, okay, this is a private home's backyard. That's one thing, but there really isn't any way to distinguish that at this point in time. Hopefully, it, when we're over the curve and when things start to plateau, the uh, governor will relax some of these restrictions. But for now, there really isn't anything that we can do about it. And as far as people walking on the sidewalk, we can request and strongly request, even demand all we want, and there are going to be people who aren't going to do it. And you can't arrest everybody who's walking down the street because they're next to somebody. You just have to protect yourself, basically. And if you think people are too close, then you have to get out of the way. I wish it were otherwise, but it isn't. It's just human nature especially in a democracy where people are used to doing pretty much what they want to do. Yeah, and walking, yeah, in, the bike lanes. walking in the bike lanes is, is a real problem because that, it's you know a problem. what the unintended consequences are there. The bikes have to swerve out of the bike lanes, now they're in the road. Right. Yeah, that, that's a major problem. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I make two clarifications sure. before the others make a comment? Uh, one is I was not in any way suggesting that only property owners on the beach could then use the beach uh, at some point. I'm thinking that by the end of April, the governor will be more open to at least having private beaches be usable if they do not cluster and so forth. Uh, so my intent would be that condominiums and their residents would be able to use the beach for walking, for exercise, um, but not for beaching, so to speak, you know. The other clarification is um, 
certainly we know that we have to follow the governor's order. However, we can give input to the governor. And I think uh, I would look <clears throat> again to the town manager uh, to provide that feedback if we feel that, you know, we've hit the peak or gone over it, especially for our time, because you know that places like in Georgia and South Carolina, they're opening up the beaches no matter what anyway. And that's based on the governor's review of the situation. And I think what is being discussed, this gets beyond our discussion uh, or our topic, I guess, but, you know, we're going to be opening up zones across the country to get back to normal. And right. so I think that Highland Beach, because it doesn't have businesses and all of that rest, we are a zone that's somewhat unique in that regard. Anyways, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I agree with you. Anything else Ev, before we move on? No, I, I think that the idea that Marshall puts forth our position to the governor's office and the county level that, you know, at some point we'd like them to consider this. Yeah, good. Okay. Peggy? Yes, sir. Thank you. Actually, last weekend, uh, I got a call from uh, a contact from Tallahassee, and he uh, photocopied and, and uh, forwarded to me, which I forwarded to Marshall, an opinion from the governor's general counsel, which provided some leniency in looking into this. So Marshall has that, and I'm sure that he will be looking into that. It, I just got a call out of the blue. And um, as for now, I do, I appreciate erring on the side of caution. I'm yeah. fine with that. I think that um, I'm very proud of our commission uh, putting forth restrictions sometime, some way before other towns nearby in terms of fighting this virus. And so um, I would love to open up the beaches, private portions to people, but let's have Marshall look at this uh, paperwork that I forwarded and uh, in the meantime, you know, maintain our strictness in order to keep people safe. And, um, and secondly, I wanted to bring up, we all received an email regarding the beach dredging and the renourishment of Delray uh, and Boca Raton beaches. And um, I did make some calls on this three weeks ago, a resident contacted me and I will forward to Marshall when I, if I get anything in writing, but basically the seven miles of ocean water reefs and seabed is owned by the federal government and they can dredge our sand right up to the low water mark if they want. Is it uh, fair or uh, is it really fair to Highland Beach? I don't know. It, I believe we should have been contacted before the dredging occurred, but then we don't own any portion of that beach, water, or sand. Um, the state owns the beaches to the high water mark, to the low water mark. And for those residents who have been weighing in on this via different platforms, I would just, you know, like to say that my Marshall, will, I'm sure, is working on it, and we'll see how it goes. But um, certainly, if ships are pulling our sand off the front of our beaches, especially in the north end, down to the Delray Sands, as this email uh, ascertained or, or alleged, then we need to know about it in advance would be nice. So I just wanted to throw that out that I'm sure Marshall will be looking into it at this uh, Absolutely. point forward. Yep. And we're all aware of this via, we all were copied on these emails. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice Mayor. Well, that was an absolutely epic segue. So uh, thank you for that, Peggy. No um, I actually got a lot of calls also on the dredging program. And uh, back in May 2019, uh, CSHB, Community State of Highland Beach, put together that nice Highland Beach library presentation by the engineer, Gordon Thompson, yeah. who had about 30 years of experience doing beach renourishment mm -hmm. for Delray, for Boca, for, for all the areas around us. And he answered a lot of really great resident questions. Yes. I'm not saying the time is now, but when we're all back in the chambers, maybe we invite him in and we pay him a, you know, for his time to come in and answer all of our questions. Because he was extremely knowledgeable on all these projects and what goes on and what's okay and what's not okay. So it might help us all, including the residents, to get our, our follow-up questions answered. Great. Certainly a worthwhile investment. Great. Yeah, I mean, I doubt it'd be much. He lived right in Boca. He actually uh, lived a few houses down from a house I rented a while yeah. ago. So, uh, and he's very approachable. I've talked to him since. Yeah. So if it will help, uh, I would add that I did 
go up to Delray, and I did speak to the uh, site project manager. Oh. I don't have his name with me right now. And uh, I, uh, we were watching the operation and whatnot, and I specifically asked, <clears throat> what are your plans? Because I understand you're doing both Boca and Delray beaches. And I said, because, you know, we're concerned about Highland Beach. And he said, there's no intention on dredging sand in front of Highland Beach, that they're only doing Boca and Delray. Now, where they might stop at the very end of Delray, they might have in the ocean, maybe some issues there, but that at least it was expressed that there's no intention on in, uh, interrupting or interfering with Highland Beach in any way. So that you can take it as a, a verbal statement and we go from there. Would you forward that uh, name and contact to Marshall, please? Will do. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, comments for me. First, Greg, do you think it's appropriate at this point, because interest rates are so low, to take a look at our current debt structure and see if any of it is worthwhile looking at refinancing at this point? It's always worthwhile to do that. Now, I know a bunch of our debt has... Um, a lockout where there's a large prepayment penalty if we prepay, but I think not all of it does, so we definitely should. And um, I know treasury rates are really, really low. Um, the high yield market and the municipal market are the two markets that are in a bit of disarray at the moment, but that doesn't mean they're going to be permanently because the government's already talking about buying municipals now as well. Right. So yeah, we should look at it because by the time we get around to it, rates might be a lot lower. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, it might be an opportune time. Definitely. Take a peek, if you would, please. Okay. Guys, I'm going to lose you. My battery is like dead. <laughs> so well, in a minute, I'm not going to be here. Now we can talk about you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, one quick thing while you're on. I just want to congratulate Marshall and thank him for the fabulous job he's been doing through this crisis. And in particular, keeping us all in communications, letting us know what's going on, forwarding all the messages, um, and just a hearty thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Here, here. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let me move on to uh, to Glenn, our fabulous attorney, and see if you have any words of wisdom for us, Glenn. Uh, what a nice introduction. Thank you, Mayor. Um, no, really, I echo what you say. Uh, Marshall's done a great job throughout this process, uh, keeping the residents informed, being very on top of all of the executive orders, administrative orders that keep coming out. Uh, just wish everybody keeps staying safe. Okay, short and sweet. Where we like it. Thank you. <laughs> well, Marshall. Got yes, me. Mayor. Thank you. Words um, of wisdom for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's interesting. I know, uh, I guess I'm going to try to speak to the public that's watching in a bit because every point of contact I can have to encourage folks to uh, adhere to personal responsibility and accountability during this times. Um, Chief Hartman and his team have been amazing through this. Um, uh, Chief probably has less sleep than I do. Um, so uh, they're doing great work, but compliance is much easier than it making us work towards enforcement. Um, so if everybody, I, I know you want to get out on the beach, it's Florida, we're here in our paradise, this is great. Um, but as you guys have already discussed, it's going to take the governor and the county to relent to open the beaches back up. And I don't see that happening anytime soon, meaning in the next couple of weeks. So in the meantime, uh, Sorry to say that your beaches are closed. Please help us out and try not to make it difficult and make us chase you off the beach and this and that, because we want to minimize points of contact for our officers with the general public. Um, we all know uh, this is a, a difficult time, unprecedented time. There, like I said in uh, the coastal, so there's no playbook for this. Uh, we're doing our best to deploy technology strategies and management approaches that we've used for hurricanes and floods and other national disasters but this is a relatively unique time um uh, i will tell you uh, being part of the eoc 
uh, we're, we're okay. We're looking good compared to other places, uh, my hometown included, are in very bad shape. Uh, that being New York City, Detroit, New Orleans, we're doing good. But again, it's the success that we're all deploying by doing social distancing and, and doing what we have to do to keep ourselves safe, stay off the streets unnecessarily for, for travel, just go for essential work only. Um, and, you know, uh, when you're on the sidewalks, just, just, you know, be cognizant, be safe. Um, I know people kind of walk out into the bike lanes. I'm getting some comments about that. Just be careful um, when you do that and uh, just, you know, uh, just just be safe. Um, if we have to continue on the virtual meetings, it seems to work pretty well. Um, I got to work on finding a way so the public can chime in. Um, so I'm working on that a little bit to see if there's something we can do. Uh, to, to handle some calls or s somehow get a little bit better public input because that is uh, the one last missing piece to uh, this virtual uh, public space, if you will. So uh, we're working on that. Uh, another oh, oh. thank you to our employees that are working during this essential time and keeping the water plant going and keeping the trash bins emptied and um, issuing building permits and public safety response. I'm again, like I've said before, the seriousness and purpose of the employees here are, is nothing less than admirable and impressive. Um, I, I don't know what else I could say. They're great. Again, uh, special thanks from me to, to Chief Hartman, um, helping me out with a little more of his experience through long durations of uh, emergency and uh, having his contacts help us when we need uh, certain things. So. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're into it. Uh, like uh, we always joke, uh, you know, maybe a little Groundhog's Day. This is day 27 for us <laughs> in the EOC. Um, I, looks like we're going to get into the 50s, but um, uh, everybody take care of themselves. Be Stay home, stay safe. Um, adhere to those practices. If you go out, be very cautious and careful, please. Um, our little paradise, we got to keep this little slice of heaven protected. So let's uh, let's continue doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marshall. <clears throat> Just uh, to everybody that's watching, listening, um, we are not through this yet. We are probably halfway through. Fortunately, we're not spiking. Uh, this curve is going up. Uh, it's not doing this. And it's not doing this because we are listening to the doctors and we're listening to the scientists. And we are keeping our distance and we are staying in so continue to do that and don't let up i'm from southern connecticut and uh baltimore washington area and both of those areas are having a hell of a time so I'm glad to be down here <laughs> okay. in a weird way yes <laughs> unfortunately my family is in bethesda and uh, they're not in the best area right now so we, we have to stay prudent. And I know it's not easy. And staying in is not easy for social animals. But um, if, uh, if you can not go two and three people to the grocery store, only one person go, um, you're going to be a lot better off. Take your shoes off outside. Don't bring them into the house or the apartment. Take a shower. Take your clothes off immediately. Jump in the shower. I'm telling you, be very, very, very careful. We've gotten through probably halfway now. Um, it's going to take us all the way through April, mm -hmm. possibly into early May before we start to turn down, uh, continuing to push this thing out. Uh, it's it's not going to be over quickly, so just hang in there, okay? And be safe. What is it? Stay home, stay safe, okay? Um, that's all I have. I'd like to call for adjournment. Need a motion to adjourn. I so move. Got a second? I second. All in I favor second. say aye. 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 It is at uh, 336 that we will adjourn. Thank you all. Marshall, thank you and your staff. Thank for you. Together. I think it worked out quite well for the first try. Thank you all. Thank Be you safe. very much. Thank you. Bye. -bye, -bye. Bye.